So what I'm going to be talking today is about mitigating spam, and otherwise known as blockchain control. And from a perspective of a lot of different blockchains, um, including, Mon of course, Monero, but also some of the so-called new open uh, blockchains. So I'll have the next slide. Big green button I'm pushing. The one with the arrow. There we go. Oh, wait a minute. That's too. F How do we go back? Red. Red and. Okay. So when we look at um, spam mitigation, um, it's easier to someone start with what is the most common uh, problem, which is email. An email is an example of something that is effectively permissionless but not private. And so how do we filter spam in email? Well, what we do is we censor. We censor and we rely on the reputation of the sender. So we, for example, run a thing through a spam filter. We also look at the history of a particular uh, server. Do they, are they sending spam? Or a type of server, for example, a compromised home system, we block them. So we asked a more interesting question. What would email look like if it was sent? You took out all the critical information, such as sender, receiver, header information, and all that's encrypted. You encrypt the email itself, and then you send it over to. How do you block spam in email? And the answer, of course, is very, very difficult to do with, with the current situation. You can't tell the spam, the bad, from the ham, the good, uh, by inspecting the cybertext or determine the reputation of an anonymous sender or provider. So that is the fundamental challenge. In an open, uh, in an open environment, you can actually censor and, and rely on reputation. In an encrypted environment, even with less than perfect privacy, that becomes increasingly difficult. Okay. There we go. Uh, one well back. So a lot of different approaches. So Bitcoin and Bitcoin Litecoins, and I'm talking things like Litecoin, Bitcoin Cash, Bitcoin SV Dash, Seed Cash, and Dogecoin, etc. They rely on a fixed block weight size, with in some cases minimum relay fees. Now, by minimum relay fees, what I'm talking about is a minimum fee that has to be paid in the clear, which is seen by everybody, for a node to be prepared to relay the transaction. Uh, Monero and Monero Litecoins, the fixed block size is effectively replaced by an adapted block size with, in some cases, the same sort of minimum relay fees. And more recently in Monero, a dual median. Uh, the Monero approach requires a minimum block row or a tail emission for the approach to work. Uh, the other thing to bear in mind is that while some things are interchangeable, a lot of things are not, so one can't easily just transfer stuff from Bitcoin over to Monero, or even vice versa. That can be a problem. When we're dealing with um, ways of dealing with this spam. Okay. Uh, am I getting a problem here with this thing? Here we go. Next slide. Okay, Litecoin. So there's a few, oh, I've missed one. I missed Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash. There we go. Bitcoin. This is the first introduction of the one megabyte block weight size in 2010. Now, in 2010, the presumption was that the anonymity level in Bitcoin was good enough. We know that's not the case today, but at the time, there was that presumption. And Bitcoin, even to this day, has no minimum node relay fee. Interestingly enough, in the early days of Bitcoin, spam attacks were not a problem when, when the um, network was not overloaded, even in 2013. Spam attacks have become a problem when the nodes are close to full, when the blocks are close to full. And that is because a spam attack in Bitcoin can be profitable um, if you own a certain, if you control a very small percentage of the um, 
uh, hash rate. Uh, and therefore, you can actually profit from spamming Bitcoin, even though the fees are very high. So that's the, uh, the granddaddy. Then we have Bitcoin Cash and Bitcoin SV. Now, they won the, they won the uh, big block approach. And in Bitcoin Cash, you had a 32 megabyte block, uh, block rate. Bitcoin SV, we're talking 128. And that has a minimum, both have a minimum Satoshi in, in their respective levels uh, fee per byte for node relay. And the most interesting example is Bitcoin SV because in many ways it's the closest to Monero uh, with respect to potential block sizes. Um, but again, the, the cost of spam a block is roughly about 1.3 um, BSV per 10 minute block. And again, I'm not aware of spam attacks on these empty chains. One of the elements that I find interesting is what is the motive for the spammer? And I'm going to come back to this point because it's a critical issue in spam attacks is do you have a motive? And if there isn't a clear motive, then the risk is immediately lowered. Okay. Litecoin. Uh, again, small blocks, Dash, a small block example in Zcash. This is the private one, or well, at least a portion of which is private. Uh, also, uh, no minimum block weight size. What's interesting about Dash and Zcash is they haven't put a, a no relay fee. Uh, Litecoin has. And again, they haven't been directly attacked. Now, when I'm talking about these uh, clear blockchains, and I refer to as private, it's important to realize that you can attack them in other ways, like, for example, uh, real-time blockchain analytics, and then use that to try to mitigate spam. Uh, but you have to do it in real time. You do have access to the transaction amount. But I haven't included, I'm, I'm assuming the quasi-private uh, private nature of it, because the type of measures in place, namely limiting the block size and, and setting a costing fee, a minimum costing fee, those are equally applicable to a coin like Monero. So in that respect, but we're not relying on, say, for example, uh, prioritizing higher transactions, which at one point was done in Bitcoin, as an example. So this being brings us to our next slide. OK. Uh, and we have Monero and Monero Litecoins. And I'm going to cover two that are interesting. So Monero basically went from the first uh, iteration of span mitigation, which is just a crypto note penalty function. And that's what started in 2014. And then Monero introduced minimum node relay fees in 2014 in response to a motivated spam attack. Now, for those of you that are more newer to Monero, what occurred there is a vulnerability was um, found. And the attacker had to bloat the block size to a certain po uh, size in order to trigger the vulnerability. And that requires the, and that required basically a certain amount of bloat. And that was the nature of the attack in 2014. The response from the community was to introduce these minimum fee for node relay, which is enforced by the node, simply says, well, we have this fee. If, you, if your transaction doesn't pay the fee, we won't relay the transaction. And then the most recent innovation has been the dual median approach, which was um, this, uh, in, in incorporated in 2019 to pr provide further protection. And I'll come back to that later in the, point, in, in the talk. Bitcoin is interesting for one reason. They also had the crypto node adaptive block size like Monero. But they recently changed to minor voting for block size. And I suspect the reason the necessity of this change is due to the fast falling block reward with no minimum block reward, not getting closer to Bitcoin and Monero. So the fundamental issue, again, is no minimum fee for node relay. But again, in, in Bitcoin, they had to change away from crypto node to a, um, a minor voting because that block reward is going very, very low. So it comes down to the fact that it's a necessity uh, of a minimum block reward in order to have the type of spam mitigation that we have in Monero today. Uh, some of the other uh, adaptive block size sites have done the same thing. Some have uh, no relay fees, typically inherited from Monero. Some may add dual and short term medians. Uh, mostly the case of the coins that are basically following Monero in, in this approach. Okay. 
Let's see if I can get this thing to, there we go. So we look at what is the tool in Monero for spam mitigation. And this is something that is, how Visa said, in primary tool comes a straight crypto note um, penalty function. And the characteristics are very interesting, but essentially what we're saying is it's a penalty if you increase the block over a certain size. And what you have is you have a maximum allowed transaction block weight, which has been set, and that's a limit in how far you can scale. And then you take the median over 100 blocks of all the, this, the, um, the blocks, and then that allows you to then move to the next uh, to, to your next blo um, base block size. So you have to have at least 50 blocks of that size and then it moves to that size. And this ba that's the basic rule. And the rule is the penalty paid by the miner. And the key element of this that needs to be understood is that the penalty for an additional transaction has to be compensated from the fees the transaction pays. That is how fees are set in Monero. So the if you want to mine a transaction, you need to pay, and you can attract a penalty by adding that transaction, or more correctly, an additional penalty. Then you have to have enough fees in the transaction to justify you mining that transaction. And this is the rational miner um, argument. In the next slide here. Uh, there we go. So basically, what one can do is one can look at this, uh, write the penalty. Uh, in a simplified manner, and essentially we take uh, the percentage increase in the block size, which is B, and then we write the penalty, strictly speaking, as the penalty that's attracted is the block reward, which is our base, the basic uh, block reward, times this percentage uh, block size increase squared. That is, a simp that is essentially, we, we rewrite the um, crypto note penalty formula in terms of this ratio B, which is essentially if you got 300,000 byte block, you add in say 30,000 bytes, the, ra the ratio for B would be uh, 0.1. If you're adding 3,000, it's 0.01. So that gives you the amount of penalty that you're gonna pay when you, when you do that. And the more interesting thing is we look at the first derivative of the penalty with respect to B. So we look at the incremental penalty that is gonna be paid um, when you add a transaction. And this is a critical transaction um, parameter. So essentially what happens is we have a transaction T with size MT, and then we look at, and we're already in the penalty regime, and then we look at what the additional penalty will be to add that transaction. So you're a rational miner, and you want to add one transaction. And that transaction has a fee, and has a penalty. And if you optimize your, your, your mining algorithm, what you do is you order your transactions roughly in order, for example, fee paying per byte. It's not strictly the optimal, but it's close to it. And then you come up with, this is how much penalty I attract, this is how much fees I get the minute I'm in the negative in the incremental transaction, then I stop adding transactions to the block and I release my mine block. And there's two cases here. And uh, if you then expand the equation, basically it's a quadratic equation, you have two BBBT, which is the case where, and you have the B squared term. When B is zero, which you write at the penalty, that the only term is B squared, and that is the term that is used to determine the normal fee. And that 2BBT is the fee, is the term that you use in order to determine if an incremental fee that a miner would pay. And, and so this is basically your um, fee per byte. So this is how fees are determined in Monero, because the entire, um, all the transactions are basically competing against the penalty. So you have a fee market, but the fee market is among transactions themselves on a block, but also you're collectively competing against this penalty in order to get your transactions in. The next slide here. So in this example, we're gonna set the reference transaction, which is basically how we set the, the, the normal fee. 
you take 3,000 bytes, which is kind of a bit of a typical transaction with, with a safety margin. You then look at the minimum block size, which is 300,000 bytes. You consider a, a two input, two output transaction at a small margin. Normal fee per byte then becomes essentially the formula is R based as BR or MN, and BR is MN or versus the size of the transaction plus the over the ratio, which is 0.01. And this is to ensure that a typical transaction will pay a fee that's large enough to scale the block weight. And so you avoid a situation where everybody's trying to, they, they don't take the default fee. If they take the normal fee, then it's at least enough to create scaling in the, in, in, in the block. At the, uh, and then we design the two other fees that are set based on this. The normal fee is two times x, sorry, the low fee, and, the no, and then there's a high fee of five times x. Those ratios are basically arbitrary in the sense that we can change those. In particular, if you want to increase the low fee, we can, can we do that? You just have to be careful that we increase it too much, then you kind of negate the fee market for the penalty itself. But you de one definitely can look at those two fees, particularly the low fee, if one is concerned of increasing fees in a simplistic way. So the next slide. Now, the, the high fee, the highest fee, this is based on maxing the penalty out. And this is critical because this is the fee that an attacker, say, doing a big bang attack would use. And this fee is basically set by the penalty uh, and the block reward. That's it. Uh, what we're assuming there, we take the derivative, we calculate a, trans uh, uh, a transaction right at the maximum penalty point. And then what we do is we assume that that's the person who wants to max out the penalty, that's the fee they attract. And essentially, we get our fee cut in fee structure. The low fee is basically 0 0.002 block reward divided by uh, MN, which is the, the, the median size of the um, medium block size. And we're, we're still dealing with a single medium situation. And then you have your normal, your high, and your highest. Now, a critical point, if one is looking, and this was discussed in Mitchell's talk, for example, if you're looking at creating a fee structure that doesn't provide information, you focus on you know, the factor of two, or whatever the factors that you want to do, and you take out the R base over MN. So you factor out the, the, um, the block reward, because that is essentially the same for everybody, and you factor out the medium block size, because again, that's the same for anybody. And then you digitize, so you create a discrete fee what was left. And that way, you achieve the goal of uh, creating the additional anonymity. But at the same time, you actually have fees that are in sync with the reality of the crypto note penalty. So this is an important, subtle point when looking at fees. And, and if I recall, you know, if you look at the, the slanting uh, graphs that were presented before, that's exactly what that is. The falling fees are showing the, the drop in block reward. And that's where we see different. So uh, what happens with time is because of how we, the block reward is, is factored in, you see this falling graph in the, in the ones. And in fact, the ones that stand out are the ones that don't follow the protocol because they just set a standard fee and then you see it flat. So that's a real uh, takeaway, but that's the design, how you would actually factor in a fee. You're factoring it in at this point. Okay, so, so they're arbitrary based on the normal fee. Minimum no real fee is equal to the low fee. This can be changed. In 2019, we did something else. We introduced the long-term medium. Now, the long-term medium is designed over 100,000 blocks. And the principle behind this is very straightforward. What the fee structure in Monero was designed to do was to address the long-term growth in the Monero blockchain by having fees that follow the reality of the blockchain. It is not intended to be a way that you, when you're dealing with a burst situation. So where the long-term medium was separating it out, the long-term growth of Monero which maintains the scalability and prevents kind of the attacks that occurred in Bitcoin. And at the same time, what we're doing is we're creating a mechanism to allow for a short burst in transaction. For example, the classic example, and there's a lot of data from Visa on this actually, um, the growth just before December 25th, you see this massive increase in transaction levels, and then on Christmas Day, it plunges. 
to virtually zero. So you have this ramp up and then a, a sudden drop. And this uh, 50 medium number was, fit, was calculated based on the visa figures plus a significant margin to allow for um, growth in the network in the short term, et cetera. But that's essentially the concept. Now here's the tricky part, because many people ask the question when this occurred, what happens if we just use a simple double medium and we take the same blocks? Well, the problem with that is that if you actually do that, you end up using your compounding rate of the uh, long-term medium becomes equal to your burst. So you don't want the 50x as your compounding rate for the long-term medium. You want something a lot smaller, like 1.4x, so comparable to the 2x in the short-term medium. And the way we have to do that is you take out the portion of a block that are included in the, in the long-term medium that exist, in, um, in, exceed the existing long-term medium by a factor of 1.4. So you do not take the whole block in the long-term medium, but only that portion up to 1.4x the existing long-term medium. And that allows you to control the growth of the long-term medium to a reasonable level, which is independent of the 50x that you need to address transaction in the short term. The second uh, move that was made, and this is a critical move, is that we calculate the fees based upon the long-term medium and not the short-term medium. This change has a fundamental implication in, a, in, in defending against Big Bang, and I'll, as I'll show in my next slide. And, and uh, so again, that's a key distinction that was made that has an impact on spam. Okay. So, block wage is, is limited to 50 times. Again, if you have to maintain the attack, maintenance cost of a bloated uh, block weight to a spammer is 50x. The maintenance cost is the equivalent to an attacking, say, something like Bitcoin SV. The compounding rate is limited to 1.4x. And that's what I was referring to in the previous slide. Okay. So here are some examples. Before we did the changes, the maintenance per five blocks in Monero would have been 0 0.025 Monero. After the changes, the maintenance at 50 megabytes is 1.25 Monero. And that was a key distinction. That was a, this is by far the most powerful anti-spam deterrence. By comparison, Bitcoin SV, which is trying to defend 128 megabyte blocks, has a 0.75 BSV on the maintenance cost to just attack. And of course, it's zero to get it there. In the case of Monero, you have to ramp it up. And if you don't maintain your maintenance as an attacker, then you also have to pay the ramp up fee again. So you can't turn it on and off. Uh, so I just put some market values, but that's sort of a comparison. That's a key factor that occurred. The second one, of course, is that we're limiting effectively in the short term the attack to 50 megabytes. You can go up to 30, but then you have to pay the maximum fee on, on spamming Monero. Okay. Now, in this example, in a very, uh, I should go back to the previous slide for a second. Okay. Um, there's a bunch of different issues is that in the existing Big Bang attack, there wasn't a clear motive other than spam. Now, one of the key elements of this particular attack is that the minute that you include the anonymization into the attack, you actually give the attack a power. Because now there is an incentive to spam. And it's the anonymization. If you want to say, combine it with some of the uh, questions that was discussed in the previous two talks, you want to get the idea that as an add-on, a big bang attack becomes a threat, much more than it was before, because now you have an incentive. Um, in realistic, there are a lot of different things, but I think targeting the privacy side is probably the, the strongest option, uh, both on the fee structure in the sense that we can refine that, some of the recommendations were made. Definitely looking at increasing the ring size, especially if we have a drop in, in, um, in fees. So let's drop that now. I'm gonna skip this slide here. Uh, I should, oh, I have conclusions. 
Counter, so, spam organized gangs are clear motive, are far more dangerous than those without a clear motive. And this is a, a, a thing that are, that's very important that I want to keep in mind. When you look at the, the, the experience, the attack on Monero was driven by a need to create a exploitable vulnerability. You need to get the, the block size or some size to do this. In Bitcoin, we are seeing attacks now, even though fees are very high. Again, with my mega, the reason is there's money to be made. So we have to look at the motive. Increasing the mixing, um, possibly increasing the mail, uh, uh, minimum relay fee, I think are reasonable mitigation answers, especially if we get efficiencies and ring signatures, as has been discussed. And questions and discussion? Uh, you mentioned briefly the attack on anonymity. It's kind of been discussed in the last couple of months of bloating uh, ring sizes with outputs that you own. Do you think that uh, if changing the fee structure to be more prohibitive to um, bloating block sizes with your own outputs is the way to solve this, or should we be doing something else? Uh, again, this is an example of a targeted attack, and an example with a targeted attack is privacy. So what I would look at is in that particular attack would be r increasing the ring uh, size because that immediately increases the cost of the attacker. Um, if you, for example, have uh, a ring, say, let's say twice as much as what we have, 20 fake outputs instead of 10, well, it's going to take twice as much spam to achieve the same level of de anonymization. And it's a relatively comparatively cheap solution. If, for example, we look at a lot of the other research that's coming out in the pipeline with respect to efficiencies and ring signatures. So to me, that's the easy way to defend Monero right now, um, mainly because of you, you also address other issues. It's also, I think, a compounding attack. I don't think standalone it, it, it is as effective. But when combined with some of the other things that have been mentioned, then it is potentially more dangerous. So again, if you address some of these other issues, such as the fee recommendations to eliminate uh, um, a fee personas, essentially, is what we want to get rid of, then again, we can tone that down that way. The, the one fee you can look at somewhat, if you want to increase it, is the lowest fee. Um, that is doable. I mean, I, it isn't really, I mean, you can even take it out entirely and just set the minimum fee, say, just slightly below the normal fee. That's a possibility. You're going to get about a five times gain. You just out of that on, on the maintenance. Um, but I would say the real answer lies in addressing the motive, and the motive is attacking the privacy side of the coin in that particular case. <laughs> 